Here's a small fact. You are all going to die. What a great way to start <laughs> off a book. So this week's book is The Book Thief. It's a book that a lot of people have told me to read a mm-hmm. lot of people have told mm-hmm. me to read. And you've told me to read it multiple times, and I finally got around to it. Mm-hmm. So what did you think of the book? You've already read it, but what did you think about it? This so I, time around. I haven't read it since like sixth grade, so it's been a long time. So it was kind of like reading it for the first time, and I just love it. Yeah. It was so good. <laughs> I think I remember somebody saying that they wish they could go back and read, reread every book like it was the first time. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of cool that you were able to do that with this book. Yeah, it did feel like the first time. I remember like the main plot points, but I forgot how good the writing is. And- you were able to fall in love with the characters yes. all over again. Mm-hmm. That's so fun. Yeah. So I loved this book. Mm-hmm. Loved it way more than I thought I would because I am kind of, or I guess I'm not, I'm not anymore. I'm slowly transitioning out of being a nonfiction snob. Mm-hmm. I feel like when I first got into reading, which was, and I say get, get into reading very loosely, I think I read the first book that I had read since middle school about two years ago when you told me that I needed to start reading more. Mm. And I was like, well, if I'm going to start reading more, I'm at least going to make it educational. And so I started reading nonfiction books. Started with books on drugs because my dad instilled some sort of weird fascination with drugs. And we just grew up watching drugs inked and locked up abroad so much that yeah that's what I started off with started off with books on Africa books on the Middle East and I just thought man I'm too good for fiction Mm -hmm. not that I (laughs) guess I'm too good for fiction I I, maybe I did think that honestly yeah what a dummy you made fun of me for what I read seriously I always did Mm -hmm. what an idiot Mm -hmm. this book was so good yeah and I think I'm slowly starting to realize that I like fiction. Yeah. And I like it a lot. Yeah, I love historical fiction especially. I feel like I learn something, but it's also entertaining and So on the on the scale of fiction, would you say historical fiction is your favorite? Probably. I mean that's what I gravitate towards. What other types of fiction? I guess there's like thrillers. science science fiction. I do like a thriller. You do love a thriller. Yeah. More of like a a cozy mystery kind of like old people solving murder mysteries. That's like my favorite genre. Weirdly, (laughs) you do really like that, but I also feel like you really like psychological and domestic thrillers, not like horror or yeah, not horror, but like wives murdering their husbands. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) like that's your jam, or framing them for their murder. You know, but yeah, all of the above. Yes, anything with oh, oh oh wife yeah doing just something getting ideas exactly mm-hmm. just stockpiling them yep just in case well i'm glad that's not your favorite because <laughs> that would be a little bit alarming but historical fiction is your favorite out of all of the periods of history what would you say is your favorite world war ii world war ii so this yeah. is right up your alley yes i've Perfect. read a lot of world war ii and where does this stack up in your world war ii grouping it's really high top top five for sure top five yeah that's lower than i would have expected but again this is my a lot of good ones this is my first probably top three but then i'm like oh but this one oh but this one like there's so many good ones this is my first world war ii historical fiction Mm -hmm. my last experience with world war ii was the rise and fall of the third reich which was like triple of this book i think like stacked up i mean it was insane so i enjoyed this one a little bit better i don't think i learned as much but i definitely enjoyed it better Mm -hmm. so what are some of your other favorite world war ii historical fictions the nightingale by kristen hannah is really high i love that one uh all the things we cannot say by kelly rimmer and the german wife by kelly rimmer all the light we cannot see. I cannot. I can't remember the author's name right now. They're making it a movie. It comes out in like November. It looks so good. That's a good one to read. And like the theaters. Uh, Netflix. 
Netflix. So, yeah, but right. it looks so good. Right, have to keep our Netflix. Oh, yeah, dang it. <laughs> <laughs> we might because it looks amazing. Okay. It's set in France and it just looks beautiful. Um, so one of the blanking th- every time when you hit record. I like leave my body and I like watch myself do this and I, my brain does not connect. <laughs> so I can't think of the names right now. We just got to get more comfortable here. That's the, off the top of my head. Loosen up a little bit. It's not a natural thing. You think podcasting is just having a conversation talking, but it's not, it's weird. <laughs> I feel like, I mean, I guess I'm a podcast veteran now. This is my sixth one. Yeah. So you're kind of a, a big, pro. kind of a big shot over I here. I have not, I don't do this in my day to day. I don't either. I do this once a week. Um, but I feel like it's getting a little bit more natural. You seem a little bit looser than the last one. Still going to stay up all night I'm thinking wondering. about what I said. Yeah. <laughs> For all like the three people that listen yeah, to my podcast. <laughs> Those three people, whoever you are, please say nice things about Olivia in the comments. I can't Just, mentally handle mean comments. You're like, <laughs> Your hair is so pretty. Oh, it looks bad with the headphones. You just have so much hair. Like a lot. <laughs> don't don't put it over your headphones. Okay. Not a great look. We're supposed to be talking about World War II. <laughs> That's okay. We can talk about whatever we want. That's this podcast true. is mine. True. Um, so this book is not about Jews, which is, I mean, there is a Jew in it, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't say that it's the focus of the book. What about the rest of your favorite World War II um, historical fiction books? Kind of another favorite. It's actually not historical fiction. It's nonfiction, but it is written oh, like way better than most nonfictions. It's The Hiding Place. Have you read The Hiding Place? I've not. I thought so for good. a sec you were going to say Anne's Frank Di- Diary of Anne Frank. Oh, yeah. I think I read I, that I've one. I've read that. I mean, it's sad and heartbreaking, but. The Hiding Place, though? Mm-hmm. It's this woman and her sister. And her father, I can't remember where they live now. Oh my gosh. Um, it's a true story. They're Christian. They're not Jews, but they hide Jews and they get caught. So they get sent to a concentration camp and she survives. I'm pretty, her father and her sister die. And then just her like forgiving like the Nazi officers and everything. I think that's the book that I was thinking. I was just about to ask you if there was a book about people forgiving Nazi officers. Well, there's that. There's that one. There's also I haven't read it. My mom's always told me to. I should read it. Is Man's Search for Meaning? That's a true story. That's the one yeah. I was thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my Where mom says that's amazing. He he like goes around and like tries to find them and forgive them. Yeah, he's about him forgiving them. Yeah. Okay. So is this kind of out of sorts, uh, for it not being solely focused on the Holocaust? No, I've. Read a lot of different perspectives. Yeah, experiences of World War Two, like you know, Jews, Germans. The German wife. I love that book. I talk about it all the time because it really changed my perspective. It's about a woman whose husband is a scientist and he's forced to be a Nazi like scientist, um, you know, to develop stuff for them, and he like doesn't really have a choice. They're going to kill their whole family, and. Um, has children growing up in this world and just how brainwashed her children are and they're taught at like their Hitler youth and like the girls program. I can't remember what it's called. Um, Like if their parents say anything against what they're taught, like to report them. So they're taught to like snitch on their parents and spy on their neighbors. And so they couldn't like teach their children at home or like they would be, you know, killed and just how hard it was for this woman to just like watch her children just be slowly brainwashed and not be able to do anything about it. Yeah, I feel like the kids in this book, in the book Thief, definitely were not brainwashed. Yeah. Like there was not a whole lot of brainwashing going on. Most of the characters in the book Thief were not brainwashed. They were, you know, most of them pretty anti Hitler. Mm-hmm. But. I definitely just think of Jojo Rabbit every time yeah. somebody says something about children being brainwashed. It's just Jojo Rabbit being like, well, I'm pretty into swastikas. It's so scary how brainwashed they were. Yeah. We read in 
one of my history classes in high school, we had to read a children's book that they had during that time about like a uh, a picture book about like the dirty evil Jews. Really? And it's like yeah, it was, the, it was like this monster who would come and steal the children. It was Jew. And it was a real book. Yeah. It's horrifying. Do you remember what it was called? Because I, I, I mean, don't remember what it. They was. kind of like allude to that in Jojo Rabbit, mm-hmm. but I didn't know that that oh, was even a real yeah. thing. I lived illustrated. In, I lived in Germany for two I don't know years. How my teacher got that? <laughs> it That's was crazy, horrifying. Like you, they would read it to their children before bed. Like, hmm. It's crazy to think. I mean, yeah, just how. How isolated they were from the real world. I mean, mm-hmm. I think it's kind of hard to, for us to imagine because, you know, with the internet, pretty much get anything. Yeah. But I mean, even pockets of the world now, like North Korea and, you know, China to some extent that are completely cut off and their government basically tells them, you know, what to believe and, you know, what what's going on in the world. And they have no idea yeah. what that perspective is outside of what comes from the government. And it's... Oh, it's scary that that can really happen. That's, yeah. And to what extent that can happen. Mm-hmm. I mean, the German people, I mean, really, that, that's like the most extreme example that I can think of. I mean, even really outside of maybe North Korea nowadays. Well, it's, yeah, it's scary how it didn't start off with him. Like, like, look, okay, we're going to do this. Like, you know, if he stood in front of everyone and said that, I would like to think that everyone would be like, um, no. <laughs> I mean, kind of. From what I read from Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, mm-hmm. and again, this is my limited knowledge from one reading one book, so I'm going to put on my not, <laughs> not a expert hat. But apparently Mein Kampf, like that he wrote before he rose to power, so he wrote Mein Kampf in mm-hmm. prison before the Nazi party really rose to power. It existed... He got thrown in prison for trying to stage a rebellion. He was in prison for like a year. And he wrote Mein Kampf in prison. And Mein Kampf basically says like, we're going to invade the West. Mm -hmm. We're going to take over Russia. And we're going to get rid of all the Jews. And we're going to create this Aryan race. And it was all written out like he was going to do it. And then for like the next five years or whatever it took or four years before like, well, I mean, maybe he's not serious, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. but the dude wrote a book saying exactly what he was going to do. Yeah. It's kind of crazy that nobody took that serious. Mm-hmm. You'd think if somebody cracked that book open and was like, have you read what this guy over here is saying? Yeah. He's kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. But then I guess you get down and then it's just slow steps after that. Like you start controlling what people read, mm-hmm. you start controlling what people are able to learn. You, you start, start controlling controlling every- art. Yeah. And then it's an entire generation. Education. Yeah. It's an entire generation of kids who literally. What is that noise? That's Jim. Oh, my God. Dude, get out of the <laughs> podcast. So unprofessional, dog. Jim, come here. That's okay. He can just lay here. <laughs> Jim's on the internet now. But yeah, going back to that, it's a whole generation of kids that literally know nothing else. Like, you mm-hmm. can't fault them. Like, how yeah. do you. How can you tell what's wrong and what's right unless you have knowledge of yeah. those kinds of things, mm-hmm. you know, the difference? And I think one of the ways that Hitler was able to do that so effectively was definitely through the written word, like mm-hmm. through propaganda. I mean, again, in the my from my limited knowledge, I mean, he worked, the Nazi party worked, I mean, I don't want to say hundreds, but I mean, tens and tens, like every major city had multiple different publications where he just basically just pumped out propaganda, written yeah. media, written newspapers, books, books, yeah, everything to just mm-hmm. try to take words and shape a nation's thoughts. Mm-hmm. And I think that's also kind of the theme of this book a lot in the book thief is kind of that the power of words mm-hmm. and that some of the characters were able to overcome that through, you know, replacing bad words with better words. Mm-hmm. I don't know. That was my interpretation of yeah. a lot of the book. Like when Max paints over Mein Kampf and I just 
totally said that wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> mein Kampf. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not gonna say any German words. Um, when he paints over it and writes his own stories, kind of using words to take back his humanity and. Mm -hmm. So if you had to give somebody one reason to read the book thief because because you said you loved it mm -hmm. what would be that reason well first off the writing is beautiful yeah that's why i think it is such an enjoyable read but i think historical fiction especially about horrific events like world war ii are important to read and why i will force our children to read them is i saw a quote once and i don't remember who said <laughs> I shouldn't wear a shirt that says I don't remember. But <laughs> they said, if we don't learn about history, we're doomed to repeat it. So I think it's important to read these stories and to you know let these people have a voice and to remind us what can happen. Yeah. So this is going to be on our kids' mandatory reading. Yes. <laughs> they will have to read the book, Thief. Mm -hmm. I think it, I mean, I would 100% agree with it. I think for me... It was just beautiful. Mm -hmm. The whole book. Again, I came from a background of probably over the last two years, I've read a handful of books, most of them probably 80% being nonfiction. I, I really do still like nonfiction. I feel like I learn a lot. And I, do, I do really like learning. Um, but I would say most nonfiction books aren't beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they're very informational. You can find them entertaining because of the topics. I think learning is entertaining. But in just the last couple, probably it started with, oh my gosh, dude, chill out. It probably started with To Kill a Mockingbird. When you mm -hmm. told me to read To Kill a Mockingbird, I think that was the first fiction book that I had read. Just kidding. I read 1984. But, and I really, I do love that book, but a little bit different. But To Kill a Mockingbird, I feel like was more artistic than 1984. Mm -hmm. 1984 was had interesting topics. To Kill a Mockingbird was just beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I would say The Book Thief is going to go down in history just as beautiful. I think it's going to be a classic. For sure. It was written, oh my gosh. I just, it's, again, the, if the theme of the book is, you know, power with words, then the author just nailed it. Yeah. Like you can't make a book about the power of words without having powerful like, words yourself. The way he just words things and like the imagery. How did you think of that? Like this one I saved when he says, trust me though, the words were on their way. And when they arrived, Liesl would hold them in her hands like the clouds and she would wring them out like the rain. It's just so good. So good. <laughs> so good. Like I, I'm not eloquent enough to like I feel like I'm doing it a disservice trying to describe it because his writing is just so powerful well not only is, is his writing I think powerful he also did something so cool with the unique perspective so yeah. for anybody who hasn't read the book the narrator of the book is death and that was kind of the first sentence of the book that I you know read at the very beginning of the podcast where he says I should have this memorized it's literally like six words but I'm terrible at this. Here's a small fact. You are all going to die. So that is the very first sentence of the book, mm -hmm. and that is death talking. And He narrates the whole book. What a cool idea. Yeah. Like, how do you come it's up so with that? so unique. Mm -hmm. And what a, like, what a perfect narrator for World War II. Yeah. I mean, he touched, he touched everybody. Yeah, he's everywhere. That's what he says. Yeah, like, I don't know. It was cool because, I mean, there there are different people in the book. You know, there are Nazis, there are communists, there are Jews, there are you know children, adults, people who do agree with Hitler, people who don't agree with Hitler. I mean, he even talks about Hitler's death in here too. And in a time where there was like just so much contention among people who were considered different. Mm -hmm. He was able to find a narrator that has just a common thread through everybody. Yeah. Like everybody dies. And what a cool perspective and a cool way to write the book mm -hmm. in that he has somebody who sees everybody and mm -hmm. everybody's perspective throughout life. Yeah. Like it was so, so cool and mm -hmm. so well done. And 
What I will say though is I really did enjoy the parts where death like narrates, but there were long stretches where death doesn't like talk a whole lot. That mm -hmm. would be my only criticism of the book. If I had to think of something, somebody was like, you need to say something bad about the book. I do wish there was just a smidgen more of death. Because mm -hmm. I thought as a character, he was actually really relatable and really interesting throughout the whole thing. And there yeah. were long stretches without him. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Did you have any thoughts on, I guess, I, death as a... <laughs> I, no, it's just, it's so unique and I've never seen it done in any other book. But... So in this copy of The Book Thief, which I think is really cool, um, this is our copy... I don't think either of us read this copy when we wrote it, though. Um, I listened to it, and you wrote it. You read it on the Kindle, mm -hmm. but I did pick it up at the very end, and because there are illustrations in the book. Yeah, those were on the Kindle. I told you to look at them when you were listening to the audiobook because they're so good. Yeah, and you can see like, what's the name of them? Mind Kampf. Yes, you can see him like painting over it. Yes, it, like, comes through the back. But in the very back of our copy of this book, there are. Some pretty cool sections and insights yeah, into the book. Awesome. And I, quick tangent, I was always the kid. Have you ever seen that meme that was like, it was second grade. I would count how many people were in front of me and I would reread my sentence over and over and over again. I think oh, that's yeah. where my anxiety <laughs> began. Yeah. You know, and the, the kid who just like was so worried about reading out loud, that was me. I'd read it a mm hundred -hmm. times over. And I still just don't like to read aloud because of that. So I'm going to make you read out loud. But I want to read a lot of these sections from the narrator or from the writer because I feel like it gives pretty good insight into the book that you don't get through just reading it. So this is actually about death narrating it. And I just want you to read the whole thing. The truth is for the first two years, I had a lot of trouble with death as a narrator. At first he was too macrame <laughs> he was enjoying his work far too much after a page of writing i felt like i needed to take a shower he was too sinister and typically death-like my first solution was drastic i scrapped death altogether and decided lisa should narrate the new problem i had was that because i'm australian as the writing progressed i now had the most australian sounding german girl in the history of all writing everywhere despite my partly german upbringing so i scrapped that idea and decided on simple third person narration at that point, I was hit by another problem entirely. This kind of narration was everything I'd been trying to avoid in the first place, so I started to look at death again. Usually, if an idea keeps calling you back, it's the right one. But this time, I had one revelation that made all the difference. I thought of the last line of the book and realized that's it. Death is haunted by us, and that's how he should narrate. I thought that one chink in his armor should be that he is haunted by humans because he mostly finds us at our weakest and our worst. He's telling Liesl's story to prove to himself that humans can be beautiful and selfless and worthwhile. When I started over, yes, again, I knew I had what I needed. It had taken two years to find the specific voice, and I was determined to write all the way through to the end. How cool is that? Yeah, that's awesome. And, like, I, I kind of like that insight into the writer's mm -hmm. mentality because, I mean, I feel like if I was sitting down to think of a book and it was a World War II historical fiction, I was like, death should narrate. I'd be like, mm -hmm. man. I knocked it out of the park. Yeah. But it's cool that he actually still struggled with death until he found that that tying part at the end with, you know, death being haunted by humans. I About death being the narrator, I've seen a lot of things like, oh, it's so dark. It's so depressing and cold. But I didn't feel like death was that way. Mm -mm. Like when he, I read another quote, um, when he says about Rudy, when he says he does something to me, that boy, every time, it's his only detriment. He steps on my heart. He makes me cry. Like, and it even there's a line that says, even death has a heart. I never felt like it was cold. I felt like, honestly, he seemed tired. Yeah, I like. I don't, I don't know if it's a he. I shouldn't. <laughs> don't want to misgender death. Yes, I don't know. They never <laughs> say that. But. Um, they do say he. They do say, look in the mirror, that's death. Uh, there, yeah, well, so for you, she then. It could be a um, she. They never, they just seem tired, mm -hmm. especially during a war. And he, death, it <laughs> says, when young men 
think they're fighting each other. They're running at each other. They're actually running at me. And just, he's, you know, kind of how unnecessary all this death is. And it's like just exhausting. Just like he's kind of like, why? Like, <laughs> yeah. And I like what it said here when he was talking about death, where he wrote it in a way that death was using Liesel's story mm -hmm. to kind of, you know, have some faith back into humanity. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so you can kind of almost relate to death a little bit in that, you know, you kind of, you kind of take stories like this, you know, incredible stories and you use those to kind of bolster yourself up a little bit and to yeah. be like, you know, to learn from them and to help you. And I think that's another reason why reading is so important. Again, coming back to the original purpose of the podcast and the reason why I'm, you know, trying my hardest to dive into books is that you know, there's so much value in stories. One, obviously it's the learning aspect. He's going to lay down. <laughs> No, you're good. So there's the learning aspect of reading, but also there's just that almost like spiritual rejuvenation that comes mm -hmm. from reading a book like this. You know what I mean? Like I do honestly feel like when I finished this book, one, I was bawling. Like this is, mm -hmm. I, I've only cried during two books so far. We'll see if anything changes. And this is one of them. But even though I was crying, I just felt like, the story kind of made me better. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I think it does that for death, which is cool because you kind of you kind of almost relate to death a little bit. I don't know. Here's a there's well, no, sorry sorry go for just, it. Um, that's one reason I love World War II historical fiction. Like there's a lot of horrible things, a lot of evil people, but there's also a lot of good people. Like rising like rising up and fighting back and you know that internet joke that's overdone like faith in humanity restored but like really like there are a lot of people doing a lot of good and amazing and powerful things that's what I love yeah <laughs> yeah and if all you ever get is you know like the news and everything like that yeah. I mean that was like my all I used to read. I used to read tons of news all day. I just scroll on Depressing. the news. <laughs> and it is. And again, I just, this book was good for the soul. Like mm -hmm. for anybody who hasn't read it, like this book was just, it was good. I was reading through Goodreads reviews about it, trying to find things to say. So because my, I like black out when we start doing this, but one woman said in her review, she's like, it breaks your heart and mends it on the same page. Yeah. I thought that was like a perfect description. That was good. Yeah. I like that. Totally stealing that, but it was so good. Um, just to kind of go back there, he has a page here about, um, about death specifically. And I just want the last line of him trying to like talk about death was, he says, I wanted death to be a missing piece of us. Mm -hmm. And I just, yeah, I think he was like, yeah. you know, I'm so glad that he chose death as the narrator because again, it's like death's journey throughout the book and just like desire to find the good in humanity. I mean, that was, I mean, it was a missing piece. Like I do think that's missing for a lot of people, mm -hmm. you know, that, that kind of just constant negativity, constant negativity, constant negativity. And so he uses Liesl's story to kind of find and fill that piece. I think mm -hmm. that was really cool. Mm -hmm. um, so not just the writing, though, but the story. Mm -hmm. Amazing story, right? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. Did you, like, were there any characters that you just felt like were underdeveloped or didn't like? No. I mean, their son, their biological son is difficult but also he grew up in that Germany so you kind of have to understand why he thinks that way yeah I mean you still don't like him but yeah I just felt like everything was so I, yeah every character is flawed 
and human. Yeah. Which makes you love them more. For me, every character was so German. Yeah. <laughs> which I absolutely loved. Mm -hmm. So I lived in Germany for two years, did a church service mission in Germany and, you know, lived with the people, spoke the language. Mm -hmm. My language was subpar, but I... <laughs> At one point was fluent, could read basically anything and everything and spoke German to everybody. I sounded like an American the whole time, but I could speak mm -hmm. German. Mine's a little rusty. I can still pick it up. And then this book was fun because I knew all of the words that they all talked the in there. The swear word. Well, you hear those a lot from yeah. little punk little <laughs> German kids and little. <laughs> yeah. But um, so that was really fun. But he did such a good job of capturing Germany. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, I think it's funny when he was like, I had the most Australian sounding little German girl because all of his other characters were so German. Mm -hmm. So like the mom, like Rosa. Rosa is German mm -hmm. like that. So somewhat like she's, you know, kind of coarse on the outside and kind of mean and but just cares so much. And you know that she loves you mm -hmm. and just kind of a little bit crusty on the outside is the way that I would describe it, mm -hmm. but just a good person. And then I loved the the lady that would walk by their front door and just spit on it every mm -hmm. single day because I was like, man, that is just so German, mm -hmm. you know, just doing the same thing every single day and just that, you know, like I'm going to show them yeah. attitude. It was so good. So I mm -hmm. felt like he really brought his characters to life because of how well he was able to, I guess, do the cult, like make that culture. But for people who don't know, it was because he actually, so like the character Liesel is actually loosely based on his mom. Mm -hmm. So he does have German heritage. And it was interesting after reading the whole book. Again, I came back to the back of the book and I was just reading through it. I was like, oh my gosh, Liesel is based off of his mom. Like that's insane. Yeah, that's so cool. So again, I want to go back to the book and just start reading a little bit here. And I just want to read this introduction section. We're just kind of jumping around that here a whole little bit. Section. That whole section. Okay. You're a good, you're a good reader. Thank you have you. a good voice. Thank you. <laughs> From the simplest point of view, I started writing the book Thief in the Australian winter of 2001 and finished it almost exactly three years later in August 2004. I still remember staying up all night to get it done, and I realize that's always the best time to finish a book. The sun is yet to come up. It seems the whole world is asleep, and there you are on your own with the pages set before you. For a writer, there's no other place you'd rather be because you know how hard it is to get there and you might never get there the same way again. From another point of view, though, I started writing the book Thief long before I ever knew I wanted to be a writer. It began in the kitchen as a young boy, hearing the stories of my parents as they told them to my sisters, my brother, and me. They never sat us down and said, now we'll tell you where you come from or come here, we have something to say. It was always with spontaneity that triggers the best stories. The conversation would remind them of something that happened when they were children growing up outside Munich and Vienna, and what stories they had to tell. It didn't dawn on me how lucky I was until after the book Thief was published. It was then that I realized that not only did both my parents have amazing stories, they were both superb storytellers. That combination is rare in one person you know, let alone in two people you're closest to. For my siblings and me, when we heard those stories, it was like a piece of Europe entered our kitchen. We were shown a world of bombs and ice and fire, we were told about kids boycotting Hitler youth meetings and mothers and fathers who refused to fly the Nazi flag. We heard about boys who were whipped for giving bread to Jewish people and other so-called criminals as they were marched through the streets of their town and the way those people thanked them. How could I ever know? My parents were only telling me about what they saw. They were teaching me how to write. So cool. Oh, that's awesome. I wish I was a better storyteller. Yeah. I'm hoping that that's <laughs> one of the things that I develop through doing this podcast and through reading books is the ability to tell stories because mm -hmm. it's so powerful. Like he says, how, what a rare combo to have a great story to tell and be a great storyteller. Yeah. Are there any like great storytellers in your life that you think of? I remember when I was little, like going to sleep, me and my brothers would like beg my dad to tell us a story. Really? Yeah. I was it a my sto dad's stories? Was it a story of his life? Like, was it? Yeah, like chopping his finger off in the car door. Like, <laughs> for some, we love that story for some reason. Or like playing Karate Kid with his brothers. 
I could see your dad being a good storyteller. Yeah. I think Adam's a good storyteller. Yeah, he is. Like, I don't yeah, know. he really is. He has just a way of, again, just telling stories. That's just so neat. Yeah. If I wish that also another wish of mine would be that a great storyteller like him mm -hmm. would write my story. This <laughs> and, author. <laughs> yeah, if I could just sit down with this author and he could run through my memories and write a story about me, I think that would be so cool. I've been thinking since finishing this book and since again, reading the back of it, what would my story be? What do you think my story would be? You know me for six years. I don't know. You don't know? No. You're a big dreamer. I think that would definitely be part of it. I think... You push yourself and expect big things out of yourself and the same for people around you. Yeah. I think if, for me... Because I've been thinking about both our stories, and so I'm interested. So mm -hmm. while I'm telling what I would think my story would be so far <laughs> in my life, I mean, there might be some major something or other later in my life, but... You can say yours first. <laughs> yeah, and then I want you to well, I want you to say yours, too. No, after. that's not what I was going to say. So be thinking of yours. I don't... Okay, say yours. What are you going to say? I don't think... Every person just has one story, and that's them. And then I think we're a collection of stories. Yeah. We have good ones and bad ones. and I would agree with that. Humans are complex. We're not. I we're not that, just one story, and that defines you. I guess that's true. A that makes my of short stories. <laughs> that makes my whole idea of what my story was just sound dumb now. No, I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm going to tell my story anyway. Just, okay. <laughs> I mean, I think you're right. That's it's, just like one of my favorite quotes from the story life of A.J. Fickery. He says, we're not novels. We're like a collection of short stories or something like that. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I guess that's true. Because like, I guess. We're not one moment or one aspect of ourselves that doesn't define us. Yeah, because Lisa was roughly based on his mom mm -hmm. and the stories that he grew up hearing. But, but this book is also kind of written, it kind of is broken up into stories. It is. And I was going to say, and I'm sure her life changed after World War II. Yeah. Like I know that there's a section of this book here in the back where he says that originally he was going to write a nonfiction book about his mom mm -hmm. post-World War II. And it was going to be called It's All Right, Ma. And it was going to be about how she dealt with everything after World War II. Mm -hmm. So again, she has stories beyond this story. Um, so like you said, it's it's a collection. Of, I mean, even this, like you said, this story has different stories. Mm -hmm. And she has stories after that. She ended up dying in Australia with her husband, her kids, and her grandkids around her. That's a yeah. whole other story. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're right. I mean, we're not defined by one story. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's good. That's a good perspective. But I'm just wondering, like, what my story <laughs> is. If somebody, if I was to tell my life story to somebody, though, what would be some of the short stories of my life? I feel like speed skating would be in there. Yeah. I feel like a common theme, though, for mine, because I think a common theme for Liesel was, I mean, one, hardship, and then two, relationships. I feel like she has a lot of relationships with people that she developed through, you know, trust. I mean, she had her mom and then she had her adoptive parents and she had Max and then she had Rudy, Rudy and then she had the, mayor's, the wife. mayor's wife. Then she had the old lady that spit on her door. Mm -hmm. And it was the common thread throughout all of her stories was, I guess, relationships and, and books, honestly, like Every connection with every single one of them was books, except for Rudy. Mm -hmm. Rudy, they were just kids that liked to play soccer. Mm -hmm. Rudy's the I best. Love Rudy. <laughs> but I do wish somebody could write my story, or at least some of my stories, because I sure as heck can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just not a very good storyteller. I think my stories would mostly consist of me being mediocre at a lot of things just or slightly above average at a lot of things 
slightly above average Brandon. That would be what, what it was amazing called. Amazing dad, though. But not her kid's favorite still, yes, you know, like, you are. no, our kid tells not me. Not the one that's nursing. <laughs> or but. the other, or the three-year-old who tells me constantly. She'll look at me right in the eye and be like, mom's my best friend. She does that to make you laugh. And then she'll be like, mom, you're my best. She does that to bug you and You're make my you laugh. Best friend, mom. And give me <laughs> side eye. I'm like, you little punk. But even then, with like, sorry, Speed Skate for a long time was, you know, about as good as you can get without actually being good. You know, I got all the way up till making the national team, you know, World Cups. And those were basically the only people that ever beat me were people that got invited onto the national team and went to World Cups. But I could never make that jump. You know, I was at the top of the list. I was always, you know, top 15, but never top six. And then with cross-country skiing, I was the kid that never missed practice, that always went and worked really hard, was really good, made varsity every year, but, like, never got to go to, like, a JNs or did well or anything like that. Started how many businesses so far? I mean, have you lost count? Because I've count. I've lost count. I mean, we found we've... all your old business cards. <laughs> yeah, you're like that one doesn't exist anymore. That one doesn't yep. exist. <laughs> I mean, we've been very fortunate and very blessed that you know we've been self-employed now for I think five out of the six years we've been married, and you know we've been able to make everything work and ends meet, and I love our life, but never really like smashed anything out of the park <laughs> again. Above average, we're making it work, but just slightly above average. <sighs> photography, I feel like I'm above average. I feel like our <laughs> photography is pretty good. Mm, it's pretty good. But no one's going to look at a picture and be like, that's a Brandon Black. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. And I just yearn to be great at something. Like really, truly great. Maybe podcasting will be you it. You are a great father and a great husband. Again, slightly above average, but still not our kid's favorite. Gosh darn it. <laughs> Hopefully podcasting will be that thing. Maybe I'll end up being one of the greats. People will like the idea about That's books. A better guess on. Oh, you're a great guest. Thank you. But you know what would help is if you liked, comment, and subscribe. Share this podcast with your friends, people. Because this could be my thing. This could shoot me over the edge. Just kidding. Maybe. But yeah, I think that would be, again, a collection of stories. My life has definitely been kind of all over the place between sports, married, living in Germany, growing up in Alaska. The one thing I will say, though, that has been constant, if I had to think of a constant thread, would be happiness. Yeah. I generally am a pretty positive person. Mm -hmm. And I think that that would be the... I guess the motivation in my story. So if somebody collected all the short stories and they just looked at all the failures and all the slight successes and things, I think the motivating factor would be that every time I try anything, I'm always just happy to be trying it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I could fail a million times. I'm just going to keep trying. And that's cool. Mm -hmm. And that's me. That would be my story. Mm -hmm. I just need Marcus. I can't even say his name. Zuzak to write mm -hmm. my story. Because that would be pretty cool if somebody could write a story as beautiful as the book Thief about me. Mm. What would your story be? I gave you like five minutes to think about it. I, I don't have one. I, Any common themes? Ones, I don't know. I think your story, because I <laughs> thought about you as well. I think your story would be told by everybody around you, not by death. Although that's that's a cool narrator. But your story would be told by everybody around you. And it would be a story about how much you care about everybody around you. And how much you make everybody around you feel special. And anybody who knows you knows that you make everybody feel special. You remember everybody's birthdays. You go out of your way to like make sure that people feel included. You go out of your way to make sure that people are happy, even at the expense of yourself. And that would be your story. It would be a story about, it'd be weird because it'd be a story about others and the whole focus would be, but it would all be you because of 
how, how you live your life for other people, which is amazing. Honestly, crazy good story. <laughs> Better than the kid who's just after. No, but that would be your story, I think. And I think it would be a very inspirational story. Thank you. Again, I can't tell stories. Though. <laughs> That's a skill I wish I had, but maybe one day I was somebody can. Thinking though, when you're talking about being a good storyteller, I, which he, the author obviously is, I don't know if you can be a great storyteller with just any story. Like looking at the back and all of his notes, like it has like handwritten notes that he did and just how much heart he put into it. Like especially it was started off with his mom. I think that's part of the reason this is so amazing, like how much heart he put into it. He's written other books and I don't know if any of them have blown up like this one. I was looking on Goodreads and they don't have good ratings. And my mom had tried to read this Bridge of Clay that it talks about on the back. And she like, was like, did not finish. I couldn't get into it. Really? Yeah. So I, this is kind of a one hit wonder. Hmm. And I think like it's, I mean, it spent, I was reading decades on the New York Times bestseller list. I think it's the highest rated book on Goodreads. It's really? like, it's this or one of the Harry Potters. I, I think like the first one. Um, it's up there. And I think it's because he put so much heart into it and it meant so much to him. So do you think it's the amount of heart and meaning behind the story? Or do you think that it has to be something incredible? I, like, do you think you can write? Cause in my opinion, to kill a mockingbird was not just contrasting. Mm -hmm. This was an incredible story. I mean, obviously world war two is just the most dramatic backdrop you could possibly have. You've got, you know, hiding Jews. You've got death, like, mm -hmm. all around her. You have this little girl who rises above everything. Amazing story. Well told. On the flip side, I feel like To Kill a Mockingbird equally as good mm -hmm. of a book. Yeah, I love that book. Not a whole lot going on. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, a trial. A white lawyer defending a black man for that time is huge. Yeah. And, but with that one, it's such a powerful story because that was Harper Lee's father did that. Oh, I didn't know that. That's. <laughs> man, again, all these personal connections and books that I just didn't know. That's. So she had some power behind her words and she put more heart into it. So that was the original question. So do you think it is the heart that you put behind it or is it the germ the amount of like the, the amount of drama in the story does that make sense because i feel like the drama in this story significantly outweighs the drama in to kill mockingbird i think it's a combination of both you think you can take a a so-so story and really put some heart and some you know love behind it mm -hmm. and tell a great story yeah, I think you can. Because I think that that, I don't know, that's a skill, I mm -hmm. think. I mean, I would hope so. Because yeah. I do think everybody has a story, not a story. Everybody has multiple stories. <laughs> so hopefully everybody can become somewhat of a storyteller of their lives. So I don't want to tell people, like, you've got nothing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because that'd be sad. I hope everybody has something. Because I definitely don't have World War II in my background. I basically have. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So. Well, on that note. <laughs> as far as. Loving the characters. And the connection that he had to those characters. I want to keep reading here. Because one of. I want to read about two characters. I want to read Liesel's and then I want to read Jesse Owens. Jesse. Not Jesse Owens. I want to read Rudy. Sorry. <laughs> because I think those are both really cool sections about his notes. And it kind of goes into what you were saying about kind of loving your characters. Or loving your story. Putting love behind it. One of the most commonly asked questions about the book thief is whether Liesel is my mother. 
The answer to that is no. There are elements, of course, of the girl my mother was, but as soon as one event is fictionalized, the character ceases to be the real person. When Liesel's brother... How do you how do you say his name? It's German. What's his name? Werner. Yeah. Dies on the train at the start, which wasn't something that happened to my mother. Liesel becomes totally herself. I never viewed her as my mother again. Liesel was Liesel, and that was it. Probably, probably the most honest thing I can say about Liesel is that she was one of the easier characters to write. It was getting everyone else working in combination with her that was the hard part. I always saw the book as a kind of love story with Liesel at his center. There's her love for Hans, Rosa, Rudy, Max, for life itself, and of course, for books and stories. Each is a different kind of love, and each adds to the person she is and becomes. It wasn't until later that I noticed the underlying themes Liesel was bringing to the book. There was a point that I, where I understood that she was stealing the words back from Hitler and Nazi Germany. She was writing her own story through the world around her. Only then did I start to know what the book was truly about. You learn about a book as you write it, and I was lucky to have a character like Liesel to show the way. And he has her quote when she says, I have hated the words, and I have loved them, and I hope I have made them right. So good. Mm -hmm. like, how do you not love Liesel? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I don't love main characters. Yeah. I loved Liesel. Yeah. Not my favorite character, though, because you can't beat Rudy. I know. <laughs> so go ahead and read Robert Rudy. There's no doubt in my mind that I love Rudy the most. Out of a whole cast of characters, I loved with everything in me. As it was, Rudy was a gift and proof that sometimes research gives you the ultimate reward before you've even opened a book. It was very early on, but I knew the kids on Himmel Street would play soccer. I also wanted them to shout the names of famous soccer players of that era, where they would commentate as they played. To find that sort of information, I began at my local library, and the search ended before it began. I can still remember vividly what happened. All I did was walk in and head toward the sports section, where I immediately saw the spine of a book on the Olympics. The faces of several famous athletes were printed on that spine, and one of them was Jesse Owens. I stopped. I felt the realization immediately and thought, I don't need any soccer players. I saw Rudy painting himself black with charcoal and running the 100 meters at the local sports field. It was one of those moments that I knew would define a character, and those moments are hard to find. In Rudy, I knew I had someone who's alive 100% of the time. Even now, I find myself choking up a bit as I write about him. I used to laugh about writers who said they miss their char characters, but Rudy definitely comes close. You do have to, like, you have to be passionate about yeah. the story. And I loved reading that at the end of the story because it just made so much sense. Like, he loved those characters. Yeah. And that, I think, is truly what makes this book special. I think there are definitely, it is a cool story. I think it's cooler knowing that it was loosely based on his mom. I think mm -hmm. it, I mean, I love, I love the German in it. Um, but I think what truly makes this book special is one, the writing is absolutely beautiful. You can just tell that he's a gifted writer. Yeah. And two, he loved his characters. Yeah. And then you do. By the end of the book, you just love the characters. Mm -hmm. Like, I loved Rudy and Liesel. Yeah. They were just so fun. And I love again, it. Max. And Max. <laughs> again, it brought me to tears. And Papa. <laughs> I cried. Wow. Mm -hmm. You know how hard that is. Yeah. I don't cry. I've never seen you cry. <laughs> I cried when my dog died. When I was in 10th grade. I cried listening to Only Plane in the Sky about four months ago. And I cried in this book. I don't cry. But this book did it to me. Mm -hmm. And I... I loved it. Like I loved every part of it. Mm -hmm. And I am slowly, slowly, slowly becoming in love with fiction. Mm -hmm. And I do think my next couple books will include, or a lot of the books in the podcast now will include fiction. And if you're somebody who's like, yeah, on the fence about fiction, give it a shot. It was so good. Mm -hmm. You know, I do think it's important to still mix in nonfiction books. It gives you a good background of things. It's important to learn. I don't know. You learn cool things. I feel like I can learn a ton from fiction. You don't feel like? I feel like I can. Oh, I feel like I can learn a ton from fiction too. Mm -hmm. But it's a different kind of learning for yeah, sure. For sure. You know, this is more of a an emotional learning. And you do learn facts, you know, mm -hmm. through the stories. But I think there's some things that you 
should learn from a nonfiction book too. But that's not to say that fiction books are not important. They're just as important. And I agree. They should be mandatory reading for our kids yep. moving forward. They definitely will be. Well, let me just flip through this real quick and make sure that there wasn't anything else that I wanted. I can't remember what all the sections were. Nope, that was it. Book was amazing. Mm. So how would you rate this book on a scale of one to five as far as importance and then... I always say fun to read, but it's not really fun to read because I don't mean like where you like, hoo hoo, ha ha, this was fun, laughing because yeah. there are sad books that are good to read, but you understand my differentiation? Yeah. Not not necessarily fun, but like importance and then enjoyment of reading. How hard it was to put down. Yes, how hard it was to put down. The perfect way to put it. Uh, five importance um, and then five like, even though I'd read it before, you were trying to talk to me, and I was like, stop talking to me. I know. You're sitting there with the kind of like, shut up. I was like, I'm reading this book. <laughs> yeah. And I get it. Um, just his writing is pure art. It's a treat to read. And importance. Why would you say it's so important? Just these stories <laughs> need to be told so we don't repeat them, like I said. I would also agree. I think five and five is what I'd give it across the board. And in the importance factor, I think I would also say that it is just important to read beautiful books. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I think they just, like I said, it's good for your soul. And yeah. it doesn't always have to be a great story, but it has to be like if the words can touch you, like it'll change who you are as a person. Yeah, It'll make you more empathetic. It'll make you, you know, better understand people you can see from other points of view you know i just all around a, a more well-rounded individual and if this world needs anything it's more of that mm -hmm. so you know anytime there's a book that can do that for somebody it's a five in importance in my book mm -hmm. and i think this is one of those books so i just thought of like 10 more <laughs> world war ii but what we can talk about yeah, maybe we'll have to read another historical one. Historical fiction. Too. Maybe we'll have to read more historical fictions. But what do you think our next book should be? I don't know. I just started Little Women. Do you want to read Little Women? I've, no, I've never read it before. I'm kind of ashamed. <laughs> ashamed that you've never read that yes. one? Yes. But I guess... But what? I'm glad that I've never read it before. And I'm reading it now. Because I don't have any sisters. I have four brothers. And then Little Women is about sisters. Like, you know, there's four girls. And I've been now reading it as a mom of girls. I'm glad that I'm choosing to read it now. Hmm. I'm just starting it. I've seen the movie a million times, but. Is there a really dope girl dad in the book? Because that's what He's I need. fighting in the Civil War. He's <laughs> kind of a cool dude, I guess. <laughs> um, that could be our next book, maybe. I do kind of want to read one of your murder mystery one of your husband murderer books so that i can oh, start to, so i can start to get ahead of you in this most of the time the husband's the bad guy really yeah does that ever worry you no i think it would require too much planning on your part that is true <laughs> so, <I'm good. laughs> but yeah we could read a murder yeah. i think that's kind of what i want to do how do you feel like this one, this podcast went in comparison to the last one, the Harry Potter? I'll tell you, I think I'm still blacked out. <laughs> You're still just floating, this is so floating over the table. Yes. Nice. Well, thanks for coming on. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to be on a lot more of these with mm -hmm. me because <laughs> I need podcast guests because the, my one alone did not, was not great. I mean, I think it was all right, but it definitely was not my best one. So. We're going to be doing this a lot mm -hmm. unless anybody else wants to come on my podcast. So if you are listening to <laughs> this come on. and have stuck around, <laughs> one, please subscribe to the channel. It helps out. Um, please like the ch video, comment, leave a five-star review on Apple Reviews. Again, I'm giving you guys a million things to do, but it all kind of helps out and will help the channel kind of move forward. 
And if you are interested in coming on the podcast, definitely let me know. Reach out. Um, you can go to my website, which I think is up and running now. So booklypodcast.com. Send me a message. Would love to have you on as a guest. I've got a giant list of books that I am dying to read now. I think my next podcast is Dune. So just to change of pace. Yeah. And I already started that one. And I like it more than I thought I would. Yeah. Not as much as this book, but more than I thought I would. <laughs> Science fiction has never really been my go-to, but it is interesting. So... But definitely reach out, let me know. Like, comment, subscribe. This has been fun. Thanks for coming on. See you in a minute. <laughs> <laughs>